correlation coefficient. So that is the thing for the bivariate distribution. So there are some lessons to be drawn from this bivariate distribution. So the thing is like this that the univariate distribution is too simple, okay, and the n-dimensional one is too complicated. So this is a good mean, the bivariate where you can calculate things and draw lessons from that. So I am just going into it a little bit more because that is uh, those things apply also to n-dimensional distributions in which we are really interested. Okay, so. <coughs> One thing which I want to say that many people, I mean, many of the even uh, researchers who are senior researchers sometimes think that if x, y are correlated, then uh, some, then any function of x, y will be correlated. That's not the case. Okay, you can form uh, functions. Uh, uh, I said Kolkata. Yes. Can you mute your microphone? Yeah. Uh, yeah, but it is gone. No. Okay. So, but uh, the thing is that uh, you can make functions of random variables, okay, which are independent, okay, correlated random variables. So people think that if you have correlated random variables, say x and y, then any function if you take some functions of x, y and one function say f of x, y, g of x, y, then uh, they have got to be correlated f and g. Okay. So this is what uh, even very, very senior research workers uh, do not uh, realize this. So here there is a simple case here, in case of Gaussian variable we can explicitly calculate and show that you can make independent variables out of just uh, linear combinations. So one such case is this Gaussian. So this uh, bivariate Gaussian, which is there, whose covariant matrix is this, the P x y was this one over two pi dead c to the half. So that was the normalization factor, and e to the <coughs> minus half. I will call this x tau c inverse x. So these are vectors, x is a column vector, x, y, okay. And uh, then you get that whole distribution which is there. Now we want to go and see how we can make uh, uh, random variables and also see what are the eigenvectors of C, eigenvalues of C and so on. So, such things are important because once you diagonalize C, so what you want to do is diagonalize C, C in this case. And if you diagonalize C, you get actually independent random variables, okay. So the first thing is to diagonalize C. So just to make the calculation simple, okay, otherwise uh, calculations are much more complicated but they can be done, actually it is not uh, possible. We will take sigma x, sigma y special case. So we'll just take this. <coughs> it is not really uh, uh, losing any generality in this thing, because one can always take uh, random variables x prime equal to x over sigma x, y prime equal to y over sigma y, and then uh, everything goes through. Okay. So if you take sigma x, sigma y equal to one, so this is actually making this transformation, if you like. If you make this transformation, then the C becomes here 1, rho, rho 1. So it is much simpler to handle. So sigma x, sigma y are 1. So you get uh, this thing. Or you make this transformation. So then it will be some C prime. Okay. So this is the <coughs> this is the covariance matrix. What are its eigenvalues and eigenvectors? Okay. So look at the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this. So eigenvalues calculate are 1 plus minus rho. So what you do is simply put 1 minus lambda, 1 minus lambda here and calculate what are the roots of this uh, equation, you know, 1 minus lambda square minus rho square equal to 0. So clearly these are eigenvalues of this. Where eigenvectors, eigenvectors of this are 
one one. Okay. And if you want to normalize it, you can put one by root two here. And one by root two, one minus one. You can check that if you just uh, put one one here, you'll get one plus row out. Okay, you multiply this by and one plus row out into the same. And if you take the other one, you'll get one minus row. So that is why you can easily check that these are the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. So what really what we are doing is, <coughs> if I write the p x y okay, in this case as uh, okay, we can diagonalize this thing. P x y equal to so explicitly you can do this. So sigma x sigma y become one. Okay, so you get only this e to e to the minus from q x y. Okay, it's a quadratic form. So I have written q. Okay. So it's a. So what you have done is you are doing is you are getting it into a normal form. That means we are diagonalizing it and getting into a sum of squares. That's all. So that is what you are doing here, and where this q x y is. 1 over 2, 1 minus rho square into x square plus y square minus 2 rho x y. So now it simplifies with this thing. The earlier uh, had all those uh, sigma x's and sigma y's, all those have been put equal to 1, so you get a thing like this, but there's a 2 rho x y here. And what is the diagonalization? <laughs> this is transformation. That is to uh, that comes from here, from here and here. So if you put uh, u equal to x minus y over root two, okay, so that is corresponding to this, and v equal to x plus y over root two. Okay. So if you do this thing, and that is the same as putting x equal to u plus v over root 2 and y equal to v minus u over root 2. So that is the inverse transformation. So what is this? What we are doing is we are diagonalizing this. As you know, it is an orthogonal matrix, okay, which diagonalizes C. So what you have is orthogonal matrix, some O, C, O transpose, okay, which makes C diagonal. So it will be some C prime or C diagonal. It makes it diagonal like this. It's an orthogonal matrix, so it's a rotation. So this is what you have done is you have simply rotated it by 45 degrees. This is a 45 degree rotation. This is 1 by root 2. Suppose u was, you know, uh, x cos theta minus y sin theta and v was x sin theta plus y cos theta. Okay, this thing. Then if I put theta equal to 45 degrees or pi by 4, you will get 1 by root 2, you will get this transformation in this thing. So what you have done is you have simply rotated the axis, okay. So by <coughs> this rotation or the orthogonal transformation, well, what are the things how you have to transform this way, thing here, it is a rotation. So you have not changed the Jacobian and all that of this thing, it is the determinant of this matrix form. But if you have orthogonal matrix, the determinant of orthogonal matrix is 1, okay, unity, so rotation. So first of all, du dv will be equal to dx dy. Okay. And remember this du dv is not a, uh, you are not just multiplying this, actually it is a, there is a wedge in between. Okay. So it is like a cross product which is coming in this thing. So du dv equal to dx dy and the Jacobian is 1 this transformation. So now, so we do not have to worry about that and since this is a rotation, x square plus y square should be equal to u square plus v square, okay. So that you can calculate just from here and the 2xy which is here, twice xy you can see from here is v squared minus u square, okay. So you do this calculation in the form, quadratic form q u v, okay, which will turn out to be 
half of u squared over 1 minus rho. Okay. You do this calculation, put this u squared plus v squared and twice rho, I mean rho into v squared minus u squared. Okay. Do this calculation and collect terms and that cancels with this one factor cancels 1 minus rho into 1 plus rho. So, that will cancel out and you will get u squared over 1 minus rho plus v squared over 1 plus rho. So, that is the transformation okay, which turns out to be this. So, you can see that this P u v u v will be 1 by 2 pi the 1 by 2 by remainder as it is in the thing. And I write these as you can see are like variances of the, this thing, okay. 1 minus rho is the variance of the variable u. 1 plus rho is the variance of, of the variable v, okay. So, I write in the suggestive fashion sigma u square equal to 1 minus rho, okay. And sigma v square equal to 1 plus rho. Okay. So, this is can be written as 1 by 2 pi sigma u sigma v. Sigma u sigma v. So, that will take care of this uh, the factor uh, root of 1 minus rho square. Okay. Sigma u and sigma v will be square roots. So, sigma u sigma v into e to the minus half u square over sigma u square plus v square over sigma v square. Okay. So, what happens here? So, the, you can factorize this. So, this is going to be factorized as 1 by root 2 pi uh, sigma u e to the minus u square over 2 sigma u square into 1 by root 2 pi sigma v into e to the minus v squared by 2 sigma v squared. So, you factorize this. And the fact that you can factorize it into functions of u and v here means that probability distribution is a factor. u and v are independent random variables. So, this can be written as p u. <coughs> Okay, so, so two other random variables u and v if you define with this thing. So, u equal to say u equal to x minus y. Just take this, okay. And x and y are identically distributed random uh, Gaussian distributed random variables. <coughs> then you get this. <coughs> the u v would be zero. <coughs> Covariance is zero. In fact, the point is that it's characterized by u v. Then just a second moment. <coughs> more of the thing is that you can see that this factorizes here. So, u v are independent or v. So, what by diagonalization what you have got is a independent random variables. This happens suddenly in the Gaussian case. independent RVs. So, one can in fact draw pictures of this, okay. So, how, how this thing will look. So, here is the, I want to plot P x y, okay. So, how does P x y look like? So, P x y is what I want to plot on this thing, or contours of P x y, okay. 
So what you do is uh, you have done this cal uh, this rotation here. Okay. So <coughs> u and v are axis which look like this. So the, if you look at this like this, this is <coughs> v axis or u equal to zero. The x equal to y in that thing. You can see that u equal to zero. Well, this is the u axis. Okay. V equal to zero. So, what are the probability distribution kind of? Uh, what are the uh, q u v equal to constant? Okay. So, you want to p u v equal to constant or p x y equal to constant? How do they look like? Okay. So, they will look like if rho is greater than zero. That is the positive correlation. Okay. Then the contours look like this. P x y equal to constant look like this. The ellipses which look like this. So it is basically this here. The sigma u which is here is tending to zero. Okay. So this kind of uh, variance is less. Where sigma v tends to two, at the most. Yes. Rho will be at the maximum value is one. Okay. So this, if you draw it like this, it looks like it's a thing which is probability distribution is looks like this. Okay. And these x and y are then positively correlated. Okay. What that means is that if x takes a value something here, say x takes a value here, y will try to tend to take the value here somewhere as if it is in this thing. So if I take x equal to x naught, okay, so suppose x takes the value sub x naught, okay, greater than 0, I am taking here. Then what happens is that I take this, I am on this axis, okay, and the, <coughs> the distribution which is there, which is called the conditional distribution, now it is called the conditional Distribution, so it is p y. Okay, in this case, <coughs> this is y p y given x equal to x naught. So this is the thing which I am plotting. Okay, so this will be over here. You can just see that it is near about here. The peak will be near about where x is equal to y. So y will tend to take the values close to x0. Okay, so that is the thing. That's why they are correlated positively. Okay, it's a positive correlation. In fact, as rho tends to 1, what happens to this? P u u. Okay, as rho tends to 1, so if I take P u u limit as rho tends to 1, it is the same thing as limit as sigma u tends to 0, okay. because where is the sigma u? Sigma u is here. Okay. Rho tends to 1 means sigma u tends to 0. So sigma u tends to 0, 1 by root 2 pi e to the minus u squared over 2 sigma u squared okay. and sigma u here. So what is this thing? This is just a delta function. Okay. So this is a delta u, or which is the same as delta essentially x minus y with some factor root two or whatever. Okay, we'll hang around there. <coughs> so as the correlation coefficient over becomes one, so they are so the, the random variables x and y are perfectly correlated. Then if x takes, x takes the value x0, y will also try to take the value x0 because it's a delta function. So it's a perfectly correlated, correlated random variables in this case. So this is called what is called the conditional probability. So it is a conditional event is defined like this P A given B. So B has occurred. And then what is the probability of A? So you have got a 
sample space omega okay is something like that there is a b there and a here okay this is the event then this is given by p a intersection b over pb okay so this is the formula for <coughs> given that b has already occurred so in our case the already occurred event is x equal to x not okay then you want to know the probability of y okay so b <coughs> in this case is the event x is equal to x not so you are on this line on this line here okay and a into and a is the event a is the event y is less than y y is less than y plus b1 what is the probability that it is the set when y lies between y and y plus dy So this is so when you are saying that p y over here, actually what this will be, it will be given by this formula p y x equal to x not will be p x not y. Okay. So you take the full distribution which is there. Okay, that is this one, or you put the x not value in there. But then you have to normalize it with this uh, PV. Okay. So the normalization is here, which is integral of P x dot y dy minus infinity to infinity. So this is the uh, <coughs> this is the y given x equal to x not. And this p x dot y is concentrated here, so it tells you that your y will try to take the value near that. So that's why they are correlated. So as soon as you have x dot here, y will try to take the value here. So this is a positive correlation. You can also have negative correlation. Okay. So that is the other way. So rho is negative. Rho is less than zero. So <coughs> If you have, so here if you take random samples here, for example, they will all look like this. They will lie like this. If rho is less than zero, then what happens in this case? If rho tends to minus one, in this case, then it's the v. Okay, that that's going to sigma v will tend to zero, okay. and that means your contours will look like this. In this case, so this is x, y here, and then your x and y are anti-correlated. Okay. So uh, this is called anti-correlation. Okay. <coughs> Because why? Because if x takes the value x not, now the y will take the negative value. Okay. So x takes x not. Y will be like minus x not. Okay. We'll try to take the value with high probability minus x not. Okay. So these are called conditional distributions and so on. So they come into this data analysis all the time. So there is a something has already occurred, and you calculate the probability a given b. Okay. So this is the. These are called anti-correlated. So in this case, for example, if rho tends to minus one, sigma v tends to zero, and you get a delta function for the v. Okay. okay so this is uh, what I wanted to do for this case. Okay. Now we go to what are called. Uh, This uh, n-dimensional variable. This is two-dimensional. Okay, you have the noise. So. 
n dimensional case okay so now it's n dimensional case so what you have is you may have the noise 0 to t this is your data tray and then you sample it at several points here okay so this is sample usual sampling kind of uh, convention is this is the 0 this is the 1 to up to n minus 1 okay so that is the sort of uh, convention that is followed so you have n0 n k r n at t k each n at t k is a random variable okay so like x was a random variable each of these are okay so n k and k goes from 0 to n minus 1 and if you do uniform sampling as we usually do then and this tk <coughs> k times delta where delta is the sampling interval and delta is the time divided by n where n is the total number of points okay, that you are sampling the thing with so this is generally numerical recipes kind of, uh, uh, I mean, what are you saying? So now what happens? So if you want multi multivariate distribution, Gaussian distribution in n variables, it is the same kind of thing, okay? So now Px, so suppose x was your data x in this case is the noise, it is an n-dimensional vector okay, in this case. Then px then goes to 1 by 2 pi raised to n by 2, okay. debt c, so formula does not change, okay. but c now is n, n cross n matrix okay, in this case. Then draw a covariance matrix and e to the minus half x star this t is transpose. Okay. So this is a, uh, x is a or is this vector x zero x one to x n minus one okay. the column vector. So this is x bar is this vector and C inverse is this thing and C is the covariance matrix, okay. So C i k is just x i x k, okay. So this is the called a multivariate Gaussian. Okay. So this is a, yes? Power n by 2 is on determinants. What? Power? n by 2 is on determinants here. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this is a square root here. Yeah. Huh. No, n by 2 is on the pi. Yes, then there is uh, linear. Where? Okay, yeah. Correct. Yeah. No, here it is sigma u, so it's already square root. Ah, yeah. No. Huh. Yeah, then here there was square root. Good. Let's see. So you get this kind of thing. Okay. So usually in data analysis and all that, this x is the <coughs> vector which contains noise and signal and so on. C is of course called the covariance matrix as before. C inverse is called the Fisher information matrix. Okay. So you get all sorts of, it is the inverse of the covariance matrix. Okay. And these will be used for defining, now we can go to geometry actually or statistics. This can be thought of as a scalar product, okay. defining the scalar product and things like that. So we will see that. <coughs> So, this is a multivariate Gaussian random variable. It's a vector random variable. Okay. So, this is called a multivariate n dimensional random variable. 
now exercise okay now this is a much harder exercise than the earlier one <laughs> for two dimensions you could actually calculate the integrals very easily okay so so prove that this thing that if you take this distribution c given by this kind of thing okay actually when you integrate out this okay this xi xk yeah show that is cik so you start with this distribution okay of some matrix which is inverse okay but when you take x i x k and integrate over those two variables okay or you not only those variables you integrate over the whole thing you will get c i k okay so earlier it was just rho sigma x sigma y or something like that and those things were there but now you have to prove in general okay and the proof will go by what how do you do the proof one way of doing it is that suddenly ha derivative ha uh, so what derivative coefficient of c then x i x k comes derivative with respect to c ha uh, elements of c ha uh, those elements of the derivative then you can pull out x i and x k in front of them uh, yeah just try that but uh, this is the inverse inverse there so it is not so ah uh, so you have to diagonalize this yeah then ha uh, uh, first you have to do the orthogonal transformation okay so multiply this by uh so principal axis transformation is what you have to do here so mc so we go to a diagonal matrix and then if you like you can redefine y y into of those absorb the m here and so on you can do that way if you like and then uh, you got a diagonal thing and so on and you will get that uh, you will get this thing so the proof is uh, one way is to first diagonalize on a this c and with some uh, orthogonal matrix so o c o t something else so diagonal matrix of the eigen values of c okay, so this will be all eigen values so there will be some lambda 1 Right. and do that that will the determinant will turn out to be this thing so it is much more simple so this is the exercise so now if this is the kind of uh, distribution for x here and x is n okay with just noise This noise is so there is no signal in the noise. Okay, here. <coughs> Then you call the noise to be Gaussian. Okay, so you got a multivariate Gaussian variable. So all this thing is a vector, okay, a random vector. Okay, and if the random vector satisfies this distribution, okay, so you can think of this as a E F. noise is called a gaussian uh, gaussian noise so this is gaussian noise you can in general have a gaussian process okay. that is a so you go to a continuous variable so instead of taking uh, uniform sampling or any sampling of this interval 0 to t then uh, you define as a uh, gaussian process on the functions n of t in this thing but how do you define that so that the definition is that if you take any finite partition you know, finite sampling of this thing 
of the function n t, then that finite thing is a random vector, and that that random vector must be a Gaussian, a multivariate Gaussian. That's a multivariate Gaussian variable. So such a thing is called a Gaussian stochastic process. So this is called a Gaussian uh, a stochastic process, which is Gaussian. So. So this is a generalization for uh, going to the continuous way. So many times I think I'll be switching from continuous to discrete, and discrete will be something like this, where you uniformly sample your uh, data tree. So <coughs> we can define a Gaussian process uh, because of that. By that. Gaussian what you do is take n samples, any n samples from 0 to t, any n sample are distributed. as a multivariate Gaussian. That's called the Gaussian stochastic process. So in this case you have the function n of t in this whatever data train to like. So it's like a random function. So it is a continuous thing which is there. Okay. okay. So this is uh, this was one of the things which I wanted to do. <coughs> so now we go to the what is called the. So this is a Gaussian noise I have defined. Now what I want to also say is about noise which is uh, colored and white and so on. So those are also the kind of things which come into the picture. So our noise, which you saw, was a detector. You know, it was a curve which looked like this. Okay, curve which looked uh, something like this. It was a curve like this for the LIGO. Okay, in this thing. So this is a colored noise. It's called a colored noise. The noise looks. The power spectrum of the noise is not a constant. So such a thing is called a colored noise. So now we have to define what is colored noise and so on. Colored Gaussian noise, white Gaussian noise, and so on. Okay. So now, what do we mean by this? This thing. Okay. So, so we have to define what is called the power spectrum. So now, this was the statistics here. Can still go through the statistics. So now. So this is the what is the characterization of noise. Okay. So one thing is we can consider usually a stationary process. So most of our signals, uh, of course, they are it depends on the kind of signal you have. If they are transients, for example, like uh, binary signal or something like that, it may last for few seconds or a minute or two minutes and so on. Okay. So if they last for a certain time, uh, you can assume that the noise in that thing is stationary. Now, what do you mean by stationary noise? Okay. So a stationary <coughs> process. The random process that goes that is defined through this function. The distribution function, if you like, f f n n of p one. 
for P0, Pn minus 1. This, this is the distribution function okay, in n variables. How do you define that? We defined it for one variable. Okay. So, how did we define that? Fx, x was the probability that x is less than or equal to x. Okay. So, this was the fx x. This was the distribution function. Now you can make you can define this for x y also, two dimensions. So in this case, if you have x y, this is the probability that x is less than x and y is less than y, and so on. So you can go to n dimensions like this. Then this is a stationary process. If this does not change, does not depend absolutely on the time here. So this is Fn, if I call this, N of T0 plus tau. So if I take a displacement in time, N T1 plus tau and so on. So this is N T minus 1 plus tau. Equal to this. This is called a stationary random process. Okay. Or if you take derivatives, then it is just the probability P and T naught up to N P N minus 1 okay. is equal to the P of N T naught plus tau to N. So noise, the statistical properties of the noise do not depend on uh, the absolute time, which is what it tells you. So this is called a stationary process. But what we take normally is called wide sense stationary. So this is generally a stationary, very strictly a stationary process. But what the kind of noise we assume for this detector and so on is what is called wide sense stationary, WSS, okay. where only you uh, worry about the moments, okay, the first two moments of this thing. So wide sense stationary means N3, this mean of the noise, is the same as N of T plus tau for any tau. So that the mean does not change okay, as we go in this. And the second one, second moment is this is the first moment, nt, nt prime, if I take this. Okay. Then this is equal to n of t plus tau, nt prime plus tau. Okay. So if you have satisfied just this two quantities, okay, two relations. If you have this, this is called a white cell station. This is a weaker restriction than this. This is much stronger. All moments will come. <laughs> Here we require only first two moments. Okay, so that is the only two moments we go to when we do our detection process. So that's why we are talking of a more general situation. Okay. So now. <coughs> What we assume in this thing is that if this is, uh, if such a, you take a white sense stationary process okay, in this thing, and this is equal to some mu, say, okay, some mean which is there, it's a constant DC, okay, in your uh, this thing, okay, which is coming out in the noise. So what you do is you subtract the mean from this, and you get a noise which is zero. So you just subtract out the DC okay, from this thing. So this is a DC like thing. So your noise which is oscillating around some mu okay, in this thing. So the first thing is that without any laws of generality actually, you put this equal to zero. Change the level of your DC. Okay. So this is NT is zero. Okay. So this is uh, zero mean noise, which you assume there. But NT, NT prime,
this is this is not zero. This can be correlated. Essentially, if your samples are very close, the samples are close here, then it it can happen that the these noise samples are correlated, and it does happen. As if you take T prime very close to T, it's going to happen because your instrument, whatever it is, has a finite bandwidth. Okay, whatever instrument you take in this thing, or a response time which is finite. Okay, so it's non-zero response time. So at least during that time you get correlated samples. Okay. So you don't get, you don't gain by sampling too much, too fast. Okay. Because you get correlated samples, you'll get the same thing. Okay. So so there is a function which defines that that is called the autocorrelation function. Okay. So this is normally k t t prime. It's denoted by k. Okay. And uh, Okay, by the way, some references which I want to give you here is that the first part, for example, the multivariate Gaussians and all that, book by Popolis is good, Popolis, okay, on uh, random processes or I think statistics and so on. Now I am going to what is the, uh, called uh, this Hailstorm, Hailstorm, uh, CW Hailstorm, statistical detection of signals and all that. So that's a... Uh, That's also a good book. Also, Weinstein and Zubikov is another book on this thing. So there are several books on this. Thing. Is out of print, is it? <laughs> okay. So then, uh, even Hellstrom might be out of print. Uh, out of print. These are old, uh, actually, books which are there. I don't know any new books which have been written. Because these books were written at that time when. Uh, During the Second World War, forty-five <laughs> <laughs> and uh, things like that for uh, radar, radars, and you know, uh, shooting missiles and all that. I mean, when you shoot missiles, a target and things like that. So you have to calculate your uh, probabilities and things like that. So all this analysis, all this scientists at that time were caught and made to work on war, war things. I mean, whatever was related with war. Oh, that also is good. Yeah. 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 And there is populist for I don't populist know. Populist we have in the yeah, library. That you have, yeah. yeah. I don't know the spelling. Something like this. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so in general, this would be the autocorrelation function. But if you have if you have noise which is wide sense and stationary, then this will become the only a function of one variable, just t minus t prime. And that can be just seen because this should be equal to. N T T prime should be the same as also N T plus tau for any tau. N T prime plus tau. Okay. So this is by the definition of white sense stationary. Okay. So <coughs> this should be equal to K O T plus tau T prime plus tau. Okay. Interesting. Now choose. Tau equal to okay, you are free to choose that, but for any tau, you just choose tau equal to minus t prime. Okay, in this case, okay. you choose that, then this k t t prime becomes k of t minus t prime and zero. So what is that zero zero? It doesn't go there for the zero. So it's a function of t minus t prime. Right? So this is a function of t minus t prime. Okay. So <coughs> this is called the autocorrelation function. Okay. If your noise is in the white sense stationary, okay, then your n t n t prime is equal to this. So 
provides and stationary ok. Then this is equal to k of minus e. So, you can assume your noise to be quite as stationary for a short period. A short period means a period but much longer than the signal how the signal lasts. So, if you have a signal like the in spiraling binary or binary stars or merger or something happening and the duration of that signal which lasts in the detector bandwidth is a few minutes or something like that. Then what you need is that the noise should be stationary for at least that period or something little bit more than that and usually it is. Most of these detectors change the noise characteristics over uh, course of the day. So, the time scales are few hours or things like that. So, hours or one hour, two hours or something like that. But if your signal is going to last few minutes, there is no problem. You can assume your noise to be in a wide sense stationary and then this goes through k, k t to the n t prime. Okay. So, this is one thing there and also this should be equal to this is just a product n t prime n t is the same thing. Okay. So, what this means is that this is also equal to k of t prime minus k. Okay. So, uh, if I write tau equal to t prime minus t, okay, then k tau of minus tau, it is a symmetric function okay, in this case. This is a, this is a symmetric of its argument, whatever the argument is. And usually it is like a bell shaped, bell shaped function. So, it looks like this. So, if this is the k, then it looks something like this, something like a Gaussian anyway. Hmm. It is a bell shaped function. This is tau, which is the thing here. It is symmetric about tau. So, if tau is small, those things are correlated as tau goes becomes larger and larger, the samples tend to get uncorrelated in the thing. So, this is the k. Okay. So, uh, so, sometimes you might define a tau core correlation, decorrelation length or a correlation length, ok, which is at the half of the value of this. So, if you take k0 over 2, the half, like the, what is that, full width at half maximum and all that which you define usually. You can do the same thing. K0 is here, K0 by 2 is here. Take this length here. So, this is the uh, tau power. And clearly, this tau power and all that depends on the bandwidth of the detector. It's 1 over the tau power, if you take, that gives you the maximum frequency. And it tells you how fast the response uh, of the detector is. It cannot be infinitely fast. Okay, so I mean that is that is the idealization in this thing. So this is usually this function. Okay. So now uh, this function, which is there, you can take the Fourier transform of this thing. Okay. So in this case, it looks like this here. What is the Fourier space for stationary noise? white sense stationary noise, it has a particularly nice form. So, it, the whole thing diagonalizes. Okay. So, the 
function that looks like this is like this that you take the Fourier transform of this noise. Okay. So nt, remember it's a random variable. Okay. So nt is a random variable. Nf, if I take this thing, oh, it's already 11:30. <laughs> Nf is uh, zero to t. So this is the this is how you have taken this thing for the data tray. Okay. Now, since this is a random variable, so is this a random variable? Okay. In fact, this is a random function in a way. And uh, what you would do is you would sample at this integral which can become a sum in this case. So NF is a complex random variable. So now we had a random variable which was which was over R. NF is N1F. So this is say real plus I into F. Okay. Both of these are real random variables. So real part and imaginary part. Okay. So if you have Z equal to X plus I Y where x is the real uh, random variable, y is the random variable, then z is a complex random variable, it takes values in the complex okay. So this noise, the Fourier transform of the noise is a complex random variable. Okay. So there are n and n stars and all that sort of thing have to be taken into account. So now, <laughs> I want to calculate a thing like this, nf, n star of f prime at two different frequencies. Okay. <coughs> so if you try to calculate this and want to calculate the average value, what happens? Average value here is KTT prime which was there. So now if you do this calculation, this would it's be... Average, uh, huh? time average or even average over transcendental? Ah, okay. Huh. So that's the thing, what are you averaging over? So in general, what you're averaging over is actually the ensemble of detectors. Okay, I mean the thing is like this that you have identical detectors. You assume there are identical detectors, okay, which are there. So T and T prime are here. This is say detector one, two, three, and so on. Okay, and this is time T and T prime. So you have a data which is flowing like this. Say you take in this thing. And n uh, t and t prime are here. So you take n t one and so on. So this average when you take n t n t prime, this is the ensemble average. Ensemble average over the detector, the identical detector, because you don't have that in practice. But this is what is the real event by this. Okay. So this would be if you take a large number of detectors, okay, n number, it would be one over n sigma whatever n t k n t prime k the k goes from 1 to n or let me take some other number m, m detectors where m is large okay, so that's an ensemble average that's what you are calculating so this average is actually so one should think of this as an ensemble average but, but in practice what is done we have only one detector one or two or three or four Okay. So then in that case, is the operational way of defining this. And then different parts of the data tray are taken together as if they are independent detectors. And then you calculate this uh, NT, NT prime or NF, NF prime, so the power spectrum for example. So there are operational ways of defining that. Okay. Yeah, so that was uh, one thing which I wanted to say over that for a Thanks for reminding me. Okay. <laughs> So now, this becomes what? Nt to 2 pi i ft and Nt prime into 2 pi i f prime t prime dt dt prime and you take the average over this. Now, change the change the variable to tau. Okay. So 
can just see dt dt prime is there. So now, <laughs> what this calculator tells us? Integral of nt nt prime e to the minus two pi i ft two pi i prime t prime dt dt prime. So these are the these are the things we have right here. But you know what this is? This is the k which was there. So this is the k of T minus C prime uh, 2 pi i F T 2 pi i F prime T prime T prime. Okay. So change the variable to tau. Okay. So change this variable to pro tau. So T prime, right? T prime equal to T plus tau. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So there is a, so you should have a plus sign. Put a plus sign there. So what you get is, if you change your variables, T prime to T plus star, you will get this thing equal to yeah. yeah. What you get is NF, NF star, NF prime star will be equal to dt, d tau, okay, in this thing, k tau. e to the minus 2 pi i f t plus, put that plus as well, yeah, thanks for the star, <laughs> f prime t plus tau. So you have this thing, so this integrates out, so if you take the dt integral, it gets a delta f minus f prime, it goes to that. So this is delta f minus f prime dt integral and the other integral is minus equal to infinity d tau k tau e to the minus 2 pi i f prime tau. This is a Fourier transform of this. So this is then written as S of f. The Fourier transform of this is called the power spectrum okay. into delta f minus f prime. It will be f prime, but it doesn't matter because f is f prime because of delta function. So you have this formula which is there. So SF is called the power spectrum. the PSD, PSD, power spectral density okay, of the noise. So this is the, and why do you get this kind of delta f and f prime and all that, you know I mean, you have got a diagonalization, okay, in the frequency space. So why do you get that? Because they assumed your noise to be white sense stationary. You have got a only a function here t prime minus t it does not does not depend on the absolute time. So that symmetry has gone into this diagonalization of the this particular quadratic form, okay, which is here. Okay, so now I think I will So what are the dimensions of this? I mean suppose n and dimensions of are all dimensionless. Okay. So many times gravitational waves the signal is dimensionless. The h which you get the power 
the metric perturbation is dimensionless. Okay. So the noise also is dimensionless. We consider the dimensionless noise in this thing. So <coughs> what happens is that it's actually the phase that is what you are looking at. So what what happens there is that you get uh, this thing of delta L, but you multiply by the laser frequency and so on. That thing 2 pi i times the new laser frequency or it's by 4 pi usually comes there. And you get a delta phi. And this is dimensionless. Okay. So the noise is in the phase noise. It's the phase noise which comes in there. So this is a dimensionless variable, the noise which is coming in. So Ns, which is there, is this dt, nt into 2 pi i mc. So there's a time dimension. So it is the dimensions of time in n f. Okay. So or if you write in terms of hertz, you would uh, you define or you you uh, calibrate the time in terms of seconds. Okay. Then this is dimension so hertz inverse. Okay. So the dimensions of n f are hertz inverse. You calculate or if you Measure the time in seconds. Okay. So this NF NF thing here, the product of this NF and star F is also S of the Right. This has dimensions of Hertz to the minus two. Okay. And delta F, this is a delta function in frequency. So it has Hertz minus one. So dimensions of this is the Hertz minus one. So SF is dimensions of Hertz inverse. So that is the dimension of the power spectral density. K is dimensionless. Hertz inverse. So now I just want to say what is white noise and colored noise and then I'll stop. So, so this is if SF is a constant, if SF is a constant, say S naught is a thing, okay. Then what you guys have is that N S and star of it prime. We go to S naught into delta F minus F prime. Okay. So if it is a constant, then this is called as white noise. This is called white noise. Okay. In the thing, white noise here. And if you want to calculate k of tau in this case, okay. K of tau is the inverse Fourier transform of SF. So it is S of a uh, e to the 2 pi i f tau dF okay. infinity to infinity. So now if you take this particular case where SF is a constant, S naught will come out and you will get a delta function, delta tau. Okay. So what is this? So k tau becomes a delta function okay, in this case. So really saying that this is a very idealization, I mean it's not a realistic case. You always have a bandwidth to the detector. You are thinking of an infinite bandwidth. It might be in certain cases you might, if your signal is very much frequency limited, okay, you might think of this as a, you know, small band, some band around that uh, frequency limit, like it may be a monochromatic signal, something like a pulsar signal or a neutron star signal or something coming in. So then in that case, uh, the signal itself is not wide band, it is a very narrow band signal. Then in that case, you can think of the noise 
having being white because of the fact that in a certain band around that the power spectrum is roughly constant. So, so this is, so it's an idealization. So this peak which was there goes as a delta function, becomes a delta function. The tau cover is zero for this. So this is uh, white noise. So tau cover is zero. But this is idealization. It's not real. You don't really get this thing, but it's very small for this thing. Yeah. Yeah. So now, uh, but I don't know whether I should uh, go further in this, or maybe next time I will do that. Gaussian white noise and things like that, okay. and colored noise and so on. So up to now, I think this is the thing which I say. So this is white noise. A noise which is not white is colored. So that is the thing. <laughs> so <laughs> colored noise is is a not white a noise which is not white. That means SF is not a noise. Okay. So that's called. A so these are the kind of things which we will assume you know, for match filters and things like that and so on. And in general, these are good approximations sometimes. Maybe. But the fact that this is like delta tau naught, which means that the samples are uncorrelated. So when you take the noise samples, nt, nt prime, delta t minus t prime. It's not into this. So the samples become, as soon as you take a sample which is some delta distance, nt, nt prime is 0. So if you take samples like this, okay, on this thing, these samples and these samples become uncorrelated. Okay, so it's uh, independent samples. So this is what is called the color of the noise. And how it is distributed is Gaussian and all that, that's a different thing. So we have Gaussian white noise, Gaussian colored noise, all sorts of things. So anyway, <laughs> okay, I'll stop here. And then the next lecture, I will continue with that. Then uh, batch filter, Neyman Pearson criterion, the match filter comes in with that. Okay, <laughs> stop. Any questions here? Okay. Huh. Oh, yeah, from the Calcutta. Huh. Huh. Any questions? Hi, sir, Kolkata. No. No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. yeah. What? Wednesday. Ah, Wednesday, Wednesday, yeah. Wednesday in the afternoon. Okay, Monday he is giving a seminar. This Monday. Yeah. Right yeah. In the afternoon. So I think the mail is already circulated. No? No? No, there was a... Yeah, maybe from Shruti. Yeah, Shruti has circulated things. On Monday afternoon, same place. At what time uh, is it? Afternoon, 2.30. 2.30. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Okay.
when it is not zero ha huh. so that actually tells you in your time sample you can take finite number of samples yeah yeah so that is restricted by the that is restricted by the detector detector itself. yeah so you cannot take infinite samples yeah that's right not take arbitrary value of time yeah, series yeah so there is a response time that basically yeah. it's a response time to detector okay so, so actually that is restricted ha uh, that is restricted. so response time is usually, i mean always non zero oh yes obviously yeah. uh, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. so it takes some time for the detector to respond to the signal so every time yeah. you get a yeah yeah signal or whatever noise or something like that so that that is tau cor so this it doesn't make sense to sample faster than tau cor yes uh, because you will get correlated uh, you will get the same thing yes you will not get in, uh, new information uh-huh. 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 redundant redundant information <laughs> yeah. and that is the same thing as saying that you have got a bandwidth for the detector this is upper frequency but okay that uh, cut off comes yeah so one over that upper cut off is essentially tau cor okay so <laughs> <laughs>